to share something that we kind of happened into and we kind of learned accidentally um, and that was something that helped us uh, greatly and if we hadn't kind of wrapped our minds around this I think it would have been devastating for us uh, as a church um, and just to kind of put some some context on this um, we we uh, moved into the <clears throat> the building when we moved in here uh, we were running about 1500 people and in the course of about two weeks, we were at 3,000 people. And then over the course of the next year, we got up to about 4,000 people. And all that change and all that added uh, amount of people brought with it a great amount of excitement, but also a great amount of challenges that we didn't quite expect. But there were some things that we learned along the way that I think will help you. And there are two things that we kind of dealt with. One was the growth of our congregation, and the other was the growth of our staff. Both of those things can be very exciting, but if you don't handle them right, they can be devastating for the growth and the sustainability of the growth of your church. So I want to talk about those two things. The first thing is the growth of your congregation. Now, if you're working in the church world, you pretty much have this idea of two ends of the spectrum. And it kind of looks like um, a funnel. And the idea is how do we open the top part of the funnel so wide so that more people can come in from all different walks of life and get started on this growth track to become a follower of Jesus. And so, you know, a lot of this is our, our weekend services um, and our big events and our outreach uh, events and those kind of strategies, that kind of thing. But then the next thing is, is how do you disciple them? And so there's always this end of the funnel here, which is where we want to fully form people to be Christ-like. And so for us, the answer has always been what we call life groups, or many churches call small groups, or maybe home groups, where we take people from the big event into the small gathering in a house. Very much like Acts chapter 2, met in the temple, then met in homes. And that's nothing new, and a lot of churches are doing that, and this was our strategy. And as a result, we decided not to do a lot of uh, ancillary things like um, uh, <clears throat> different um, Bible studies that were women only or men only or different programs that would cause people to not do this but do another. And here's what I mean by that. In our culture, our people drive 90 minutes one way to work and 90 minutes home. They usually leave around 5.30 or 6 in the morning, and they get home around 7 or 8 at night. And as a result of that, they don't have any time to come out to a midweek service or a Bible study at the church or a class or an event or those kind of things. And so we learned very quickly, we could really only expect people to do two things, come on the weekends and get into some kind of a life group. The life group meets every week. Not everybody makes it every week, but it has consistency there. And we feel like if you get into a life group, that's where we apply what we talked about on the weekend. And that's where we kind of grow people up and through the life group, that's kind of the way we've decided to do ministry. It's very simple church, very connecting church. If you're familiar with those books, that was kind of our primary influences. And so we had dialed in this philosophy back in the theater days and been working on it for several years. And we moved into high school, we kept working on it. And suddenly when we moved into the building, we grew so rapidly. And part of it was growth of people who had never been to church, <clears throat> but a lot of it also was people who had never been to our church. And what happened was a lot of people came in with either baggage from their previous church experience or expectations from their previous church experience. And so they carried that with them into our weekend services. And if we were to just plug them into a life group, guess what? They would take all those you know, expectations and all that baggage right from here to here to a life group leader who's not quite prepared or equipped to handle all those conversations. And we began to hear rumblings about, you know, life groups who were kind of imploding because a few people showed up and wanted to question the strategy of the church and redirect the ship even of that life group. And so what we've kind of stumbled on 
is this thing that is kind of the in-between, the weekend experience and the life group, or through your outreach and your discipleship. And it is what we simply call first step. And this is kind of our intro to real life. And a lot of churches have these things. They might call it 101. They might call it um, a starting point. And a lot of them go on for six or seven weeks. Here again, because of our time issue out here and the amount of weeks people will give us, we've decided to shrink this down to one morning for about 90 minutes uh, for people to come together and hear about, here's who we are as a church. And in this particular setting, We teach people where we've come from. We teach them about our non-denominational background. We teach them about kind of how we go about doing church, why we do weekends differently than maybe other churches do them, why we focus on life groups and why that's such a primary importance for us, why we don't have competing things against life groups because people will choose those versus life groups and we feel like this is the best way to mobilize the church and to send them out. And so in this first step class, we walk through all those different scenarios to hopefully answer a lot of those questions. I try to stop by there for about five or 10 minutes at the beginning and answer some big questions. A few of our pastors are there to teach it and some of our elders are there as well to help answer questions and just walk people through why we do church the way that we do it. Now, at the end of our first step class, we give people a tour of the building. Um, People always like to see kind of the behind the scenes experience. And I got this idea from Don Wilson uh, over at Christ Church. And it's just an amazing idea because when people get to see things going on, they feel more ownership. And then you get to pitch volunteering to them. And when they get to see children's ministry and they get to see uh, the tech area and all that, they think, well, I could do that or I'd like to do that. And that's a good way to recruit volunteers that way. So this first step class has actually been huge for us to try to assimilate people into life groups, but also deal with their baggage and their expectations. So I want to share with you uh, something that has been uh, the key point of our first step class that has been so liberating for everybody. Because all of us that have any kind of church background come into it with not just expectations, not just baggage, but also beliefs about what a church should consider to be not only important, but also essential. And if you're familiar with our restoration background, you realize that we are very uh, you know, supportive of this idea of in essentials, unity. And so we kind of wanted to just address some of these topics people were bringing to us, but give some framework as to how to deal with them. Okay, so let me just walk you through what we teach. We talk about these concentric circles. And the first circle, let me go ahead and put the other two up here. Here's the second one. And here's the third one. The first circle is what we call um, not essential, and not important. And unfortunately, these are some things that churches fight over and split over. And in this category, we put things like the carpet color, which oddly enough has split churches before, the paint color, um, music style, and the volume. Our church is loud. And we've just decided to embrace that. We played the game of up and down and up and down every week, and we'd always get comment cards. We've just decided we're at this level. We're just going to deal with it. And there are headphones there at the guest services table if you want to pick those up. Um, We are a very casual place, and our people on stage wear jeans. And uh, uh, they, they look nice, but they look contemporary. They look casual. And so we just go ahead and put all those things in this outside circle and just address it with everybody in the room who's new and just say, listen, you may have noticed this. This may be different from where you're coming from, but we just think this is a non-issue. This is not essential and not important. So we're not going to fight about it and we're not going to argue about it. This is just kind of who we are. And if you don't like that, that's okay. You know, it's just kind of who we are and why we've decided to do ministry this way and and those kind of things. So we walk through some of that stuff. The second issue we talk about is, um, I'm just going to abbreviate here, not essential, but it is important. 
Okay, these are getting into some more of the theological questions. Now, we have um, in, in our, where we live, we have a, another college that's a Christian college um, that is very expository based, um, very reformed. Uh, and as a result, uh, they kind of populate our community with a lot of people with that kind of thinking. And when they wander in here, uh, they wonder why we do things the way we do, and why we believe what we believe. And they wonder if we're all that spiritual because we're not always expositional, but sometimes topical in our teaching. And so this is a great chance to address that. You know what, those are important issues. Topical versus expositional. Let me explain the difference and why we do it two different ways. Um, This is where things like Calvinism come up. And people ask that question, or it's better phrased as, uh, are you, you know, believe in predestination or eternal security or those kind of things. And these are chances for us to talk about that. Things like uh, the use of the gifts and speaking in tongues and uh, even uh, things like Uh, practicing communion every week. We do communion every week. Some churches do it once a month. Some churches do it once a quarter. Some churches just kind of fit it in as the series allows. We just do it every week and we just address it. We always have somebody that asks a question about that. And here's what I've learned about those issues. Those are important issues. It's important for us to talk about things like, are we predestined or not? It's important for us to talk about how the world will end. It's important for us to talk about how often we should take the Lord's Supper but they're not essential to salvation. They're just not. There will be a lot of people in heaven who were Calvinists, and then there'll be the rest of us who were right. That's what I always tell people, I'm just kidding. But those are issues there that we basically have to agree to disagree on, where we say, I want you to know that if you choose to be part of Real Life Church, you may differ from us in those things. You may take a different view on the end times than we do. You may take a different view on communion than we do. But it's okay. Because even though they're important issues, they're not essential to either your salvation or even to membership in this church. When we cover those things, it is so freeing for people to basically figure out what to do with their pet belief. Everybody's got some kind of pet belief they drag around with them to every church wondering, do you believe what I believe? And sometimes people go, I can't handle that, and they leave. But a lot of times people say, now I have a place to put my pet belief, and I know where to store it. It's what I believe, you differ from it. We have a guy in our church that we're talking to right now about coming on our board, and he said to me, You know, I've been coming here for two years now, and in the entire two years I've been here, there's only been two times I have absolutely disagreed with what you've said. I said, oh, okay, and we talked about those things, and they're they're falling in this camp. Not essential, but important. And I said, now, why are you okay with that? And he said, because the last church I went to, it was two things every week. It gives you some context to understand what do I do with this thing that I used to feel so passionate about. And it also allows you to further highlight this right here is what really matters. This is what we refer to as our essentials and important things. They're both essential and they're both important. These are the things that as a church we'll die for. And these are the things that could cause us to break fellowship. Let me just walk you through these. These are what we refer to as our six beliefs and six practices. With our six beliefs, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, church, Bible, and humanity. And if you go to our website, it lists in detail what we believe about those six things. Then when it comes to our six practices, worship, prayer, study, community, outreach, and service. And it also lists on there what our beliefs are about those things. This allows us to narrow down the things that we feel like are of highest importance around here and we think are essential, not just in your growth, but some of these definitely in your salvation, your understanding of Jesus. And so when we have people that would normally come into our life group and say, hey, um, aren't we the same as the Mormons? In the first step class, we get to talk about, here's our strong stance on Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God and the Bible. When people come in here and to our life group and they would used to say, why don't we support the United Way? 
Well, we get to talk about our view on humanity and thus life and why we support the things that we do in different ways, maybe than organizations that might also support things that we don't agree with. This class and this drawing has saved us endless arguments and has allowed us just to be very upfront with people at the beginning as to this is the kind of church that we are and if you wanna join us, that's great. And there's gonna be some things that we disagree about. There's gonna be some things that we continue to just work back and forth about. But these are the things that we are going to be all about. And we have found that the amount of people that join us after this are more dedicated and more devoted and more understanding of what it is that we're trying to do. And then when they move into a small group setting, they're better members of that small group, they become better leaders of that small group, and then they turn into better members of our church because they've understood what to do with their baggage, their essentials, and their pet beliefs. So that's kind of how we have learned how to deal with this whole growth of our congregation. Our weekend services obviously are designed to help people decide to follow Jesus, but we also every single week push people to this class. Fill out your little communication card, sign up for the first step class, go to the class, and in there we push people to life groups. We find on the weekend if we push everything, we push nothing. So we just push this, and then this will push people to here. And by teaching this, it allows them to be better suited for that class. Okay, here's the second thing I wanna talk about. And that is, not only did we experience growth of our congregation, we experienced growth of our staff. Now, we were a church that was staffed for about a church of 1,200 people. We grew to 1,500, then we grew to 3,000 to 4,000, and we had to catch up quickly with our staff, and we had to wait until money allowed. And when money finally started coming in to allow us to do that, we started hiring a lot of people. And it, you know, every staff meeting, I'd show up there, and it looked like we've you know, almost doubled the room. More and more people start showing up in there. Now, the danger in that is, is suddenly you look out and you've got a room full of people and the majority of them were not here in the good old days. They were not here in the theater days. They were not here in the high school days. They don't know the blood, sweat, and tears that it took to set up and tear down every weekend and to raise money and build a building and move in. And they come from different church backgrounds and so they have different expectations and ideas as to how a staff should be run or what a church should be like. And so what we found is if just a few times a year we pull everybody together who's new and do a brief orientation about here's the way we operate a church here at Real Life Church, it has helped us so much with the growth of our staff. Because the truth is, if the enemy can split your staff, he can split the church. And that's often where it starts. And it starts innocently when some staff members focus on something here that is not here and division occurs and slowly one you know, silo of ministry starts pursuing something that we're not about and it begins to cause this great divide. So several times a year, I just gather all new staff members together and I walk them through what I call you know, new staff or new hires orientation and tell them just some basic things that they need to know. So that's what I wanna share with you right now. The first thing I tell them is, we're so glad that you're here and we want this to be a great experience, so enjoy. It's a great thing to work at a church. It is a lot of fun. And you may not work here for the rest of your life, but I would hope at the end of your life, when you look back and think about your time on this church staff, you'll reminisce with great memories, that it was a great experience. I mean, we get to have a lot of fun, we get to celebrate a lot of highs, and we get to um, be in the business of life change. There's not a better job than that, so enjoy it. The second thing I tell people is, but be cautious. People are watching you. People will know you're on the staff and the way that you behave, the things that you say and the things that you do, the things that you put on your Facebook will impact the way they view the church. I also tell people to be cautious not to think that this is gonna be church camp 24 seven. I mean, a lot of times people join a staff because they think this can be so much easier than working out in the workforce. And in some ways it is because there's some more flexibility, but in a lot of ways it's, it's tougher because it's all encompassing. Now I also tell people be cautious not to put the other staff members up on a pedestal. Don't look at me and think that I'm perfect. I will let you down. I will offend you. I will make you mad. So don't see any of us as Jesus. Recognize that the church is a, a place that has a staff that just happens to be filled with people. 
and everybody has their own mixed bag of problems. And so we have to learn how to deal with that. We spend a lot of time talking about conflict resolution, what's the proper way to talk to somebody when they've offended you, because we're all people. And so as a result of that, I just remind people of this, that we are not a family, we're a team. Now I know that sounds like heresy, but the church staff is not a family. The church is a family, okay, but the church staff running this organization is not a family. And I always tell people, you have a family, you have a life group, they're gonna take care of you, I'm gonna pastor you as much as I possibly can, but at the end of the day, we have a job to do, and that's to win, and that's to succeed, and that's to excel, and that's to reach people, because we're in the business of saving souls. And so as a result, we have to operate with the highest degree of excellence and integrity as a team. You know, just happened to live near Los Angeles, um, being a Lakers fan. Every year that the Lakers don't win a championship, it's always about who are we trading? Who are we firing? Who are we getting rid of? Who are we bringing in so we can win a title? And it occurred to me one day, if an NBA team spends that much attention and money and detail on getting the right people on the team and moving the wrong people off, shouldn't we be even more attentive to that? Because that's just a game. We're talking about eternity. And I just want to tell people up front, I love you, and I want you to succeed, and I want you to be part of real life church forever. But when it comes to the staff that helps follow God's lead in this place, we may have to move you around, and there may be a time that you have to leave. We want to keep the right team in place. And that may mean there comes a day when I'm not here as well. God's mission is always bigger than our feeling of family at a workplace. So once I say those two things, then I let people know four tools that they have to have in order to operate here on this staff. And the first tool uh, that I talk about is, is the Bible, okay? I just tell our staff, I expect you to be the most spiritual people in our church. I just do. No one should read their Bible more than you. You should be in the Word every single day. And one of the things that we use around here is this thing called the Life Journal. We got this from Wayne Cordero's church in Hawaii. It's just a great way to journal what you read in the Bible. And it has daily readings for every day of the year. It'll walk you through the Bible in a year. It's fantastic. And we teach our people in our church to do this. We teach this at our first step class. And I expect my staff to do this. I do this every day. I expect our staff to do this every day. And what this does is this gives us a context for conversation. We can start meetings with, hey, what'd you think of the reading today? And suddenly it unifies everybody because we're all reading the same thing. So I just expect everybody, the Bible, the life journal, highest importance, that's a tool that you use. Here's another tool, and that is the communication card. Every church has some kind of thing like this. When I was a kid, our church, we called this a silent roll call card. Uh, this is a way for people to communicate back to us things about their life. And this is the whole thing we do in our weekend services where we push people to fill out this card, hoping that they'll sign up for a first step. We move them into a life group, that kind of thing. But on this card, they can fill out their information. And on the back, they can let us know of a question that they have, a prayer request that they have, or a class that they want to take, mainly first step. Sometimes the decision is, I want to join a life group. I want to serve somewhere at Real Life Church. I want to uh, be baptized, those kind of things. And here's what I tell people on our staff. This card is the most important thing that will pass across your desk. This card's more important than money, more important than your mother, all right? This is gold because this represents somebody actually took the time to write down their name and ask for help with something. And if we leave a stack of these on the corner of our desk saying, I'll get to them later, guess what? By the time we get to them, they can't be gotten anymore. That's why immediately on Sunday, we start putting these into the computer so that on Monday, they get an email. On Tuesday, they get a letter just so we keep in contact with people. And when there's something specific on here, we get it to that ministry area. And I want people to know following up on this is the most important thing that they do. There's nothing worse for me as a lead pastor to be standing out in the lobby and somebody comes up to me and says, I have a problem with this. I suggest someone who can help. And they said, oh, I tried to get a hold of them and they never got back with me. That's the worst. 
So I just tell people from the start, follow up on your communication cards. Here's the third thing. This is just a little card that we print up here at our church. It's just a little piece of stationery, but we refer to it as a thank you card. And I just tell people, listen, we cannot pay our volunteers with money, but we pay them with gratitude. Write cards all the time to everybody in your particular area of ministry. Write cards to people that are below you. Write cards to people that are above you. Write cards to people that are on the level with you on the org chart. Encourage everybody all the time. Say thank you over and over and over again. And if a staff member needs a thank you to come from me, come and tell me and I'll either write it or I'll type it up and send it to them or you can type it up and I'll sign my name to it. Whatever it takes, you thank people all the time because it matters that much. And don't think that just because somebody volunteers all the time, they love the church so much and they don't need a thank you. I've had veterans of volunteers walk out on us because they just felt like they were overlooked. You gotta say thank you all the time. Okay, here's the last thing. I expect everybody on our team to keep a post-it note near their workspace, maybe on their computer, of the names of their neighbors who do not attend church. What I've noticed in doing church work for now almost 20 years is we have a tendency to drift towards people just like us. And we surround ourselves with fellow believers in our life group. We surround ourselves with fellow believers on our cul-de-sac. And if we're not careful, we will continue or start to operate ministry based on what other believers want rather than what those who do not know God yet need to hear. And I want people to all the time be thinking through the lenses of the people next door to them, down the street from them, at their school, the people that are on their kid's soccer team who do not know God. How can we connect with them? This is my list of names. These are my neighbors. This was very helpful for me um, about a year ago. We had something happen in our church where we made a decision um, to move our Sunday night service on Super Bowl weekend to Saturday night. We just decided to admit the fact that everybody in our church wanted to watch the Super Bowl and all those who went on Sunday night were gonna stay home and watch the Super Bowl. And we embraced it and said, you know what? Do that with your life group. Invite your neighbors over to watch the Super Bowl. So here's what we're gonna do. That weekend, we're gonna move our Sunday night service to Saturday night. I had a couple who'd been part of our church for a long time absolutely go ballistic on me. These were people who were far from God, who came to Christ here. I got to baptize them in a hot tub and now they're fully on fire for Christ. And during that continuum of their lifespan, they forgot what it was like to be lost. And they got so bent out of shape that we would move a church service for a Super Bowl, for a game, the words that were coming out of their mouth sounded like things I'd heard out of 50-year-old Christians as far as like been a Christian for 50 years. They were so set in their ways suddenly about you should tell everybody to skip the game and honor God. Well, we did that service on Saturday night. And guess who showed up at that service? One of the people from my list. And when I met him out in the lobby, they said, you know, we've been thinking about coming to church for a while and we thought we'd do it this weekend, but obviously we got big plans with the Super Bowl all day Sunday. But when we heard you had a Saturday night service, we said, we'll do that. That has opened up so many conversations with them about God and church as a result of that thing. Having this post-it note reminded me, even though I love that other couple that got mad at me, and they're still here, this is why we do what we do. So these people can be found. Because somebody did that for us. And I tell everybody on our staff, you have that post to note, you have those names, because that's why we do what we do. So over the course of the last few years, it's been a crazy ride around here at Real Life Church, <clears throat> and we've discovered that you can have the big event, and you can even have great, great discipleship. But if you don't figure out a way to connect the two, and if you don't figure out a way to Bring your staff in on what it is you think God has called you to do as a church. You'll go in many different directions. So I hope this has been helpful for you as far as understanding how to just 
connect with the growth of your congregation and the growth of your church. And I hope and pray great things for your ministry wherever you are. Thanks so much. Thank you.